Father, again, we thank you for this opportunity to just uh, explore your word and to glean from it the challenge that you have laid out there. And so, Lord, we pray that our hearts would be open, that we would be receptive to what you say to us, that it would be transforming in us. And we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the Chinese authorities entered a house in December of 08, and uh, it was a, a house church that was meeting, and they arrested the Christians that were there. They fined them for proselytizing, for illegal assembly. Uh, they sentenced the leaders to re-education through hard labor. The Christians that live in such circumstances exhibit a level of commitment that we rarely see here in the United States. More recently, we've uh, seen, you know, in the Middle East, Christians being run out of their homes, um, Christians being killed and, and uh, executed for their faith. And uh, we, we see a level of commitment with them that boy, if we could transfer that here where Christianity is so easy and our ability to call ourselves Christians just comes so easily to us uh, that, that we find ourselves without that level of commitment. And so when we look at this first chapter of Ruth, uh, we find that there are some things in there that we need to pick up on, some, some lessons that we need to learn, and to follow what it looks like in the life of Ruth to make a commitment to follow Jesus. The first thing that I want you to notice in, is in verse 8, we're going to look at starting at verse 8 in this chapter. And he says there in, in verse 8, And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead, referring to her two sons and with me. Uh, Ruth faced discouragement from Naomi. Naomi was trying to convince her to go back and not follow her as she returned to her land. Now, you remember the story, Naomi uh, and her husband, uh, Elimelech, uh, they, they spent about 10 years, the text tells us, there in the land of Moab. And while they were there in Moab, Elimelech, first he dies. The two sons marry two girls, Orpah and Ruth. And, uh, and, and then the two sons end up dying. And so Naomi finds herself with only these two daughter-in-laws. And she hears that now there is prosperity in the land of Israel, that the famine is over. And so she would, desires to go back to her homeland in the land of Israel. And the two daughters-in-law decide that they're going to go with her and follow her. In fact, you remember the famous line that, that Ruth gives, you know, wherever you go, I'll go, and where your people will be my people. And, and so as, as she was going back to the land of Israel, uh, these two girls decided that they're going to go. And as they are traveling on the way or getting ready to, to, to make that journey, uh, Ruth, I mean, Naomi decides to convince them to stay. And she, she discourages them from making the journey. And, and I want to allow you to see today that, that we need to have the kind of commitment that can supersede discouragement. How many of you know that even sometimes the leaders that we follow as we follow Christ can discourage us? That's true. Sometimes the people that you look up to can discourage you. Certainly the people around us that we walk with can discourage us. There's a whole lot of discouragement that comes our way. And we need to have the kind of commitment that will supersede the discouragement that we have. We need to not give up in the face of discouragement. 
And so I appreciate when I see people who, who are involved in ministry and, and through the hard times and through the discouragements and through the difficult times, when it's hard to get yourself up and out, they continue to serve the Lord. They continue to do what God has called them to do. They, they continue to minister and to use the gifts that God has given them, uh, even in the face of discouragement, in this face of discouragement. And so I want to, I, I, I want us to, to take note of that. Somebody needs to maybe write that down because if discouragement is part of your problem, if it's an issue in your life, if it's an issue in your ministry, then, then here's a note that you can make and underline that uh, even Ruth faced that kind of discouragement, but she was able to overcome. One of the best autobiographies is that of Lauren Isley, and she wrote an autobiography called All the Strange Hours. And in his, in his book, uh, he, he tells of an incident early in his academic training. In fact, it was his first English class that he went to, and they had a writing assignment, and, and he spent long hours trying to get this writing assignment uh, in the right form, and he finally hands it in, and the teacher accused him of not writing it himself. And the teacher said, it's written way too well for a freshman, for somebody in their first English class, and accused him of not writing it himself. Well, and back in those days, you didn't back talk the teacher. So uh, he just turned around and he left. And, and you know, because of that discouragement, he never, it wasn't until he was in his mid years of his life that he began to write again. And he ended up writing books and articles and bestsellers, great works. But, but the question is, how many things did we not see written because half his life was lived under the discouragement of that first English teacher that he had? Wow. How many works, great works that are we missing today because he had that discouragement? And I believe that God has something special for you to do and for me to do if, and, and too many of us allow discouragement to stop us. We allow things to get in the way and hinder us from moving forward. And so we need to make sure that we don't let discouragement turn us around. Think about Moses at the Red Sea. You think he was discouraged? I'm sure he was discouraged and all the people around him were discouraging. He didn't have anybody rooting for him there at the Red Sea. He didn't have anybody pushing him forward, encouraging him to go ahead and, and do what God had called him to do. Uh, and yet in the face of all that discouragement, he pushed forward. Uh, you know, there's an old Japanese proverb. It says, when you've completed 95% of your journey, you're only halfway there. Think about that. And some of us, you know, we, we think that we've done all that we can do. And I, I guess my challenge is keep on going. Amen. Keep on moving forward and allow God to use you and the gifts that he's given to you. Amen? Amen. The second thing that I want you to see is that we need to make sure that we're committed in the face of enticement. Take a look at verse 9. It says in verse 9, the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. Now here is Naomi telling them, these two girls, that, you know, back in Moab, there's a nice life waiting for you. Back in Moab, you can find rest. You can even find there's some, some hunks there in Moab that, uh, you know, everything you're looking for is right there in Moab. 
And you don't need to follow me back to the land of Israel. There's rest there in Moab. And I can imagine all the enticements. Their mind must have flashed back to, to all the people that they knew and all the family that they had and all the opportunities that were there in Moab, all the connections that they had. And, and, and I'm sure that they must have felt some pull, some tug in their life to, yeah, Moab sounds like a good place to be. But, but you know, as many times when we find enticement in the world, when we find that pull in our lives, uh, pulling us in other directions, pulling us away from ministry, pulling us away from time with God, pulling us away from our first love, pulling us in other directions. We need to allow our commitment to God to overcome even those enticements. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And uh, too many of us, we, we get trapped. Uh, a, a preacher one time was shown sights of New York City by friends while he was visiting New York. And that night, after seeing all the lights and the tall buildings and everything and the amazement of being in New York City, he, he laid on his bed and he said, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to see these wonderful sights of New York. And thank you, most of all, that I didn't see anything that I wanted. And sometimes we see the lights and we see the enticements and we see the opportunities and we think that rest is there. We think that fulfillment is over there. We think that opportunity lies somewhere else and we end up walking away from what God has called us to do because with the bright lights have us all tripped up. And I want to challenge you that uh, we need to make sure that our commitment overcomes whatever enticement we find. Uh, I'm sure that the rest that Naomi was trying to sell sounded uh, just like what the doctor ordered. But Ruth was committed to follow Naomi, and she did. And so the challenge for us is to stay focused in the face of every enticement to turn back. And you know what? Sometimes the enticement is not just for us. Sometimes the enticement is for people around us. It's for family. It's for children. It's for, uh, you know, other people that, that, that we get pulled away. We're enticed into opportunities for them, things that pull us away from what God has called us to do. The promise of money, position, acceptance. Sometimes it's respect, sometimes it's security, appreciation, love, happiness, well-being, all those things uh, we find that, are, that many times we think the road to those things are somewhere other than showing up to do what God has called us to do. Amen. Amen. And so we need to make sure that enticements don't mess us up. The third thing I want you to see is in verses 11 to 13. Just look in your Bible and let's read that together. I'm reading from New King James. Verses 11 to 13, it says, But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourself from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Now, I want you, I'm going to come back to her argument there in a little bit, but look at the very end of verse 13. Naomi, part of her argument was that the hand of the Lord was against her. And, I, and so I, I want to say that our commitment to follow God needs to stand in the face of even good reason. It was good. It was hard to argue the logic that Naomi used. Uh, after all, she was getting up there in years to think that she was going to get married again. 
After all, she couldn't provide, even if she did, logically, if she had a baby today, uh, the, these girls couldn't wait for that baby to grow up in order to, to marry one of her sons. So it, it didn't make any logical sense. It made more sense for them to go back to Moab and find themselves a husband there in Moab. Uh, it was hard to argue with her logic. Why hang around when she obviously can't help them anymore? But you know what? Here is what I want you to see. We have to remember that a good reason is hardly ever the whole picture. Oh, you didn't hear me because I'm filled. I got a room filled with people who have good reasons. Right. And if I were to go up and down the pews and ask every one of you, you know, why aren't you using your gifts and resources more fully for God and his service? I am sure as I'm standing here, there is a room full of good reasons. Right. Every one of us has good reasons. But a good reason is hardly ever the whole picture. And so we need to, we need to challenge, you know, Naomi had some good reasons. She had some good points. There's no question about it, but that what she said, her argument made a whole lot of sense. And I'm sure it made sense to these girls, but, but that's not the whole picture. And we need to remember there's a bigger picture. When we focus on the good reason, we lose sight of that big picture. You remember the story of Jacob. He focused on the good evidence that his sons brought back with that bloody coat of many colors and and he looked at that good evidence in front of him and he concluded with good reason that uh, that God was against him uh, how about Peter when uh, Jesus told him to, to come and step out out of the boat and walk on the water Peter had good reason for staying in the boat I mean, it made no logical sense for him to think that he could step out of the boat and walk on the water. He had good reason for staying in the boat, but his good reason was not the whole picture. Right. You see, many times we have good reasons, but our good reasons are all temporal, material concerns about this world. How many times are our good reasons involving the eternal view that God wants us to have? How many times are our good reasons for not doing what God has called us to do? Uh, how many times are, are our good reasons involving what that eternal view, that, uh, that, that big picture that God wants us to have? Uh, we get so caught up in the here and now. We get so caught up in what looks good for the moment and, and this life and, and the concerns over this life. And we have some good reasons, but they don't take into view the promises of God. They don't take into view the power of God. They don't take into view that he can make a way where there seems to be no way. They don't take into view that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And that if we step out of the boat and put our feet in the water, that he can make it happen and he can pull it all together. Somebody needs to hear what I'm saying today. The problem is that most of our good reasons are concerned about the financial, the material, the, 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 the issues surrounding our lives right now. But there's never a good reason to turn away from your commitment to follow God. There's never a good reason to turn away from your commitment in your marriage. There's never a good reason to follow, to turn away from your commitment to follow in godliness and, and holiness in your life. There's never a good reason to turn away from witnessing and sharing the love of God with others. There's never a good reason to not use your resources and your gifts and your abilities to to, as our mission says, to share God's love with the world. Amen? And so let's be committed even in the face of all of our good reasons, because I'm sure you have a good reason. I'm sure in the back of the sanctuary you can give me a good reason. 
but uh, but but sometimes we need to take a look at the big picture, which is bigger than our good reasons. We spend so much every day. Time, money, we use up, we waste so much. We spend time and money every day until it's all gone. Precious resources, powerful resources. What if you, what if you reinvested your time into prayer, your resources into support to help us plant churches, prepare leaders, and proclaim the gospel? What if you became a prayer fellowship partner? GOGF has been planting churches, preparing leaders, and proclaiming the gospel throughout the world since 1961. 14 churches on the eastern seaboard, producing weekly radio broadcasts that reach around the globe. We have ministry training in India, Africa, and the Caribbean. Partner with us. Partner with God. Invest in expanding and supporting His kingdom worldwide. Become a prayer fellowship partner. You have the time and resources to make a difference. Number four, at the end of verse 13, we, uh, I want you to see that we need to be committed in the face of bad theology. Bad theology. It was bad theology that Naomi had to conclude that God was against her. It was just bad theology. She had a bad view of God and what God can do. Bad theology, how many of you know bad theology can turn your head around? Bad theology can, can get you off track with God. And that's why you have to be careful what TV preacher you listen to. Amen. Because bad theology can mess you up. And so we need to be we need to be careful about how we view God and 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 how we understand what God is trying to say to us. Naomi is a good example, uh, along with many others that we can learn from about how bad theology can mess us up. Her conclusion was that God was against her. And God is now get this write this down and underline it if you have to. God is never against his people. Amen. God is never, are you part of God's children, God's family? God is never against his people. Sometimes he takes us through things that aren't pleasant. Sometimes he tests our faith. Sometimes he pulls out the strap and chastises us. Amen. But God always has the best interest of his people at heart. Amen. He's never against his people. And, and we can, sometimes when we get this feeling that God, woe is me because God's against me. I must be cursed or something. Because nothing seems to be working out. Let me assure you, if you're a child of God, God is for you and who can be against you? Amen. He is on your side. He is rooting you on. And don't allow bad theology to mess you up. If God is for you, who can be against you? And so we have, we, we need to go back to the word of God and understand that he loves us and he cares about us and he wants what's best for each one of us. And so uh, that's where Naomi went off. That's where Job's friends went off. Uh, that, that's where so many down through the Bible that they get off. That's where Jacob got off. Jacob was another one that said, oh, God's against me. Uh, we, we, need to, we need to understand that God is always for his people. And if you are a part of the, the family of God, he loves you and he cares about you and he will always give you the victory. It might be third and 17 in the fourth quarter, but we know who wins. Is a good football analogy for today. To kick off the season. But, uh, but we need to understand God is always on our side. And we can, uh, we can stand firm and allow our faith to, to be with him and not allow bad theology to mess us up and to discourage us. It's bad theology not to believe that we have victory in Christ. And then lastly, 
uh, verses 14 to 18. Look at the story here, starting at verse 14. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after, her sis after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Now, now, you know, she's she's trying to wrap her mind around following Naomi. Naomi discourages her, but, but that's okay. No, no, I'm following you. Uh, she, she, she has her mind taken back to all the enticements there in Moab. And, and, and she, I'm imagining that she struggles a little bit with that, but she says, oh, no, I'm, Naomi, I'm following you. And, and all the, the issues, the bad theology that's brought to her about who God is with, uh, Naomi fights through all of that and, and she says, no, I'm, I'm following you. And now her sister-in-law, Orpha, decides, you know what, I'm out of here. I'm going back. And I didn't want to take this trip anyway. And so she turns around and she goes back to Moab. Now, you would think that, that here's Ruth in the face of all this discouragement. Now, girlfriend is turning back and going back to Moab. Here's another piece of evidence that maybe I'm, I'm not doing the wise thing. Maybe I need to follow the crowd. Maybe if everybody else is not coming out, maybe I shouldn't come out either. Uh-huh. Let me leave that one alone. Maybe, maybe, maybe what we need to do is to fight through that even when others don't keep their commitment to God, we're going to do our part. Even when somebody else turns back and stops following the Lord, God, uh, your people are going to be my people. I'm following you to the end. That's the kind of commitment that we need to have. I think when we look at the story here of Ruth, that's exactly what we see. We see that kind of commitment from Ruth. And that's the kind of commitment that I want us to have as we move forward into this next season of ministry uh, as we step out of this summer. And so Orpah decided to turn back, but that didn't seem to phase Ruth. Let me share a story with you in closing, and then we're going we're gonna to be done. Adrian Grassley was used to working, was uh, somebody who worked with precious metals, specifically uh, an expert in diamonds as a diamond cutter. And uh, he was uh, uh, compared to Michelangelo, who worked with marble and could cut out great statues and could look at a piece of marble and see the beauty of a statue that lied inside that marble. And uh, so Adrian uh, got this commission to deal with this big diamond, one of the largest diamonds in 1944 that was known. It was a special diamond, uh, and it was called the Liberator Diamond. 155 carat rock, worth millions. And carry that one on your third finger. <laughs> 155 carats. And, uh, and he studied it for two full months before he began to make his cuts and chip away at this diamond. One wrong move would instantly ruin the potential of that great rock. And, and you know what? Your life and my life is very much like that diamond. There's so much potential that lies in us. There's so much that God wants to bring out of us. There's so much that he wants to accomplish through us. And we need to, we need to make sure that we study what God is trying to do and we commit ourselves to the entire process of having God work through us. And let me tell you, it's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be pleasant. 
It's not always going to be filled with joy and laughter. It's not always fellowship opportunities. Sometimes it's with tear. Sometimes it's with pain. Sometimes it's with, it's with discouragement. Sometimes it's in the face of friends and family and others turning away and walking away. But our commitment to God needs to be firm and fast and steadfast like Ruth. I'm going where God leads me. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. And he's given each one of us as his children. He's given us gifts. He's given us abilities. He's given us a supernatural opportunity to edify the body of Christ and to share his love with the world. And so I want to, I want to challenge you that you are important. And we need your commitment. We need to move forward together. So I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. And I wonder if in the quietness of your own life, just between you and God, think about the issues of your life. And what is it that you're going to allow to stop you from being fully committed to following God? And ask God to help you to overcome whatever that discouragement might be whatever that good reason might be, whatever the people around you might be saying, I wonder if we can commit ourselves to working together because we need each other. Would you do it? And maybe I'm talking to somebody here today and you're not sure that if you die today that you're on your way to heaven. You're not sure that your sins are forgiven. You're not sure that you're in that family of God. We want to make sure that you know about your relationship with God before you leave here today. And whatever your need is, just an upraised hand, say, Pastor Tony, just pray for me. Say one like that. Yes, amen. I see those hands. Yes, I see those hands. You want to fully commit yourself to following him. You want Ruth to be an example to you. I just want to pray with you. Is there others? Just slip a hand up. Yes. Amen. I see that hand. Any others? Last call. And I'll pray for you. Then, Marco, let's stand on our feet for that closing word of prayer. And you know what? On this homecoming Sunday, I think it'll be a good thing if... Those of you that raised your hands, just meet me down front. Let's pray together. Whatever that issue is, whatever that need is, just come down and let's pray together. Let's bring it before the Lord. Amen. Amen. Join me in prayer for these that have come, others that raise their hands, maybe some that needed to raise their hands. Gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you that we have this example that we can look at in the life of Naomi and Ruth. We pray for that kind of commitment in our own lives. Lord, we think of these that have come. You know what their needs are. You know what their prayer requests are. You know what the issues that they need to overcome in their lives. We thank you that you have a plan for each one. Help us to execute that plan. Help us to not be the ones that turn around halfway. Use us, we pray, to your honor and to your glory. And may Montco Bible Fellowship stand as a testimony in this community to the love and the grace and the mercy of God. May each one of us play a role in that and be used by you. And we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.